Thank you, Dr. Kirsch, for the excellent presentation. This was very educational to all of us. We will be following up with a few additional interesting cases that we were not able to accommodate in the original early birth session. The first presentation will be by Dr. Brookman from Stellenbosch University, Cape Town, South Africa, followed by a few cases presented by Dr. Tanti Mangosi from UT Health San Antonio. Please welcome both speakers. Thank you. Not always squame. I present to you the rare entity of follicular dendritic cell sarcoma of the tonsil, presenting as cervical nodal metastases. My name is Jonri Brugman, and I would like to acknowledge my co-workers for their contributions. All the authors are affiliated with Stellenbosch University, based in Cape Town, South Africa. Ethical approval and written informed consent was obtained. A 65-year-old male presented with a five-month history of an enlarging left leg mass and no other symptomatology. On physical examination, the neck mass felt both solid and cystic and attached to the ipsilateral parotid gland. Our pharyngeal examination revealed a small submucosal sessile polyp on the left tonsil. The first imaging investigation was a contrast-enhanced CT of the neck and chest. Axial image on the left demonstrates a small ovoid isodense mass in the left tonsil. The left neck nodal conglomerate displaces the carotid space medially. Coronal reconstruction demonstrates the cranial solid and enhancing portion of the neck mass, as well as the caudal cystic and multisectated part. The chest imaging was normal. Next, MR of the neck with intravenous gadolinium was performed. Sagittal T1-weighted, fat-saturated post-gadolinium MR image shows the mixed solid cystic nature of the neck mass with enhancement of the cranial solid portion. Superficial parotid gland infiltration was suspected based on imaging findings. Axial T1-weighted image on the left and fat-saturated post-gadolinium image on the right demonstrates heterogeneous enhancement of the solid cranial portion of the neck mass. The tonsillar mass is T1-weighted iso to hyperintense to cervical muscles. T2-weighted and flare hyperintense to muscle, not shown, and demonstrates minimal post-contrast enhancement. The left carotid arteries and internal jugular vein were not infiltrated. DWI and ADC map demonstrates diffusion restriction in the cranial solid component of the neck mass. The pre-imaging biopsy of the left tonsil and fine needle aspiration cell block of the neck mass revealed follicular dendritic cell sarcoma of the tonsil with cervical nodal metastases. The patient was staged as a clinical T2N1 M0 sarcoma at the multidisciplinary team meeting and underwent a left-sided modified radical neck dissection with a superficial partial parotidectomy and bilateral tonsillectomy. The primary tumor was confined to the left tonsil and the cervical nodal metastases involved left neck levels two and three with microscopic invasion of the superficial parotid gland. Microscopy revealed the typical story form and world growth pattern of follicular dendritic cells, with confirmation of the diagnosis on positive immunohistochemical staining for multiple follicular dendritic cell markers, including D240, shown in the figure on the right. Subsequently, the patient's pathological staging was PT2N1. In view of the large nodal disease with extracapsular extension, the multidisciplinary team decision was to offer adjuvant radiotherapy. This was tolerated well, and on last assessment, the patient was still in remission. Follicular dendritic cell sarcoma is an exceedingly rare malignant neoplasm of follicular dendritic cells, with 41 cases of extranodal follicular dendritic cell sarcoma identified by 2010, half of which were of tonsillar origin. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first case report illustrating 
the MR features of extranodal metastatic follicular dendritic cell sarcoma of the head and neck. Although squamous cell carcinoma accounts for the overwhelming majority of head and neck malignant neoplasms, extranodal follicular dendritic cell sarcoma of the pharyngeal region can have a similar clinical presentation and thus needs to be included in the differential diagnosis. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Bandit Tanti Wongkosi. I'm from the University of Texas Health San Antonio. I would like to thank ASHNR for the opportunity to present challenging cases. I have no disclosures. Case 1, a 44 years old woman with chronic neck pain without neurological deficit. On CT, you may see a calcified mass arising from the right oxyprocondyl involving the jugular foramen and hypoglossal canal. There is another component of the lesion that shows ossification and exophytic component. Of course, there is compression of the cerebellum and brainstem, but the patient does not have neurological deficits at all, suggesting that this lesion is slowly growing over time. Um, there is also involvement of the C1. On MRI, the ossified component demonstrates hyposignal intensity in every sequence without enhancement. The calcified component demonstrates mixed T2 signal, T1 hypointensity, heterogeneous enhancement, and infiltration into the prevertebral soft tissue, no restricted diffusion. Bone scan demonstrates increased uptake in the area. So differential diagnosis of aggressive skull-based lesions with calcifications and ossifications include aneoplasm, particularly those that form bones or cartilage. Since the patient, um, since the lesion contains both uh, calcification and ossification, it is possible that the patient has both chondrosarcoma and osteosarcoma. In that case, it's going to be so unusual. There are not a lot of uh, soft tissue components to make it an ossifying fibroma. Would this be an intraosseous meningioma? Um, chondrosarcoma is unlikely because there's not much of T2 hypersignal intensity. Could this be metastasis? You know. Anyway, um, or this could this be a non-neoplasm? Uh, we don't know. Until the pathologist came by the reading room and and showed the slide, she said there's there's a lot of um, mineralization matrix. There's some soft tissue component right there. This is the calcification and uh, this is the ossification. The majority of the areas demonstrate um, mature bones formations, but she cannot find a single cell of malignant tumor at all. This turned out to be uh, a calcifying pseudoneoplasm of neural axis or capnon. Capnon is a, a type of fibroosis lesion. It tends to involve a middle-aged man. The etiology is unknown. It tends to grow slowly, does not cause a lot of symptoms given the size of the tumor or the lesion. It is non-neoplastic, non-metastatic, but it is body infiltrative. There are characteristic or distinctive pathologic features that I show you on the pathology slide. Imaging are not characteristic. It may show calcification, ossification, mixed signal intensity with variable enhancement. And the treatment is the is, um, total resection. This is another published case of extra dural petromastoid capnon. To me it just looked like just look like a, a tumor with internal bony matrix. Could this be calcifications in there or ossifications or could this be a venous malformation? So I think um, I think biopsy is uh, the, is needed for final diagnosis. The second case is a 26 years old woman 
who came in with difficulty of swallowing, and we found a well-defined hypo-enhancing solid mass within the base of tongue. It looks, it looks really, really well-defined. And um, there's not much of um, hyperdensity in there. So the first thing I think is, could this be a lingual thyroid? But um, guess, guess not, right? The lesion is very well defined. You may even uh, see here there's a capsule or pseudo capsule. It is hypo intense on T1. It is very bright on T2. Look like a light bulb with some internal signal intensity. So this is a solid lesion without restricted diffusion. It enhances a lot on MRI with contrast, but it does not enhance much um, on CT with contrast. So differential diagnosis of a non-aggressive base of tongue lesion in a young adult is a lingual thyroid, but um, it is excluded because there's not much of iodine there. Lingual tonsillar hypertrophy, um, typically it is enhancing lesion and um, it typically shows striated pattern of enhancement. Thyroglossal duct cyst is quite unusual because this is a solid lesion. Hemangioma, uh, typically seen in, in infants or someone younger. And this lesion does not show strong enhancement and it does not have flow voice at all. Venous malformation, well, it at least should show some enhancement. Even there's no fibrolids, but I think, I don't think we can exclude venous malformation. Could this be a microcystic type lymphatic malformation, of course? Microcystic lymphatic malformation can look solid. Could this be mixed vascular malformation? Of course. I don't think this is a lipoma or dermoid because there's no fat component. There's no restrictive diffusion, so it's very unlikely to be an epidermoid inclusion cyst. Rhabdomyosarcoma tends to be aggressive. Or could this be could could uh, could this be something really rare? And the path shows multiple spindle cells within within the lesions and this is characterized as Anthony A and this is Anthony B. So this turned out to be a base of tongue schwannoma. Oral cavity schwannoma is rare and lingual schwannoma you know mostly involves the the oral tongue. So isolated base of tongue schwannoma is very very rare. Well I think the clue is is uh, the non-aggressive features of the lesion is hypo enhancing on CT and it's very bright on T2 so that could be a clue for a schwannoma and uh, this is a companion case from literature you may see this the lesion is very well defined and it's very bright on T2 with internal T2 hypo intensity it does not enhance much on CT, but it enhances a lot on MRI. And uh, this is to compare with tonsillar hypertrophy in young kids or in young adults. You know, tonsillar hypertrophy tends to have striated pattern of enhancement. Squamous cell carcinoma tend to be solid, infiltrative, and aggressive. And this one has internal necrosis. And this is the schwannoma I just show you. For lingual thyroid, you want to see um, hyperdensity before contrast. The third case is a 60 years old woman who has past medical history of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. She presented with progressive sensory neural hearing loss. And within the cerebral pontine angle, you may see a strongly enhancing solid lesion with internal necro necrosis or cystic components. In Frehley, the lesion is very complex. It has some cysts, it has some solid components. It extends into the uh, internal auditory canal. There are T2 hypo-intensity signal there, which could represent flow voids, hemorrhage, or calcifications. To me, this looks almost like a vessel within the lesion. At that time, um, we think about, well, could this be lymphoma? But lymphoma tends to be solid and there should not be a lot of cystic component in there. Would this be um, 
a nerve chief, the tumor of the seventh or eighth nerve, of course. Could this be, could this be a complex looking meningioma? Yes. Or something else like choroid plexus papilloma, ependymoma, or metastasis. Well, this turned out to be a hemangioblastoma. So hemangioblastoma, um, the common one is in the, the cerebellum, right? But if it's in a wrong place like that, like this case, it is very difficult to think about hemangioblastoma. But there's some clues. I think the clues are um, flow voids that turn out to be not calcifications or hemorrhage. And this looked like, um, look like a vessel there. So um, this could be a clue. Here is a published case of another CP angle hemangioblastoma. Even that, there are no flow voids in this case. So it is rare because of the location. Um, given, you know, CP angle is not common for hemangioblastoma to occur. It can compress the seventh and the eighth nerve. It has, you know, non-specific cystic and pattern of enhancement. But if we see flow void, we have to think about this case as well. The last case is a 67 years old man who came in with left-sided multiple cranial neuropathies from the 8th nerve to the 12th nerve. On CT, there is an ill-defined infiltrative, mildly enhancing mass within the oropharynx and nasopharynx. There is erosion of the skull base right here. Obstruction of the eustachian tube, seen as a fluid accumulation within the mastoid cells and middle ear cavity. The region erodes the bones, and there is a soft tissue component, very non-specific, and it is very hypermetabolic on PET CT. At the level of the skull base, um, at the jugular foramen, at that time we think about could this be a glomus tumor, but well, there's no, there's no flow voice and there's no salt paper appearance, and this one is quite aggressive, involving the the um, the dura as well. Differential diagnosis at that time, we think about an oropharynx or nasopharyngeal carcinoma that invades the skull base, you know, resulting in lower cranial neuropathy. Could this be a lymphoma? Very unusual to be glomus jugulare or um, vulgare because we don't see characteristic imaging appearance. Could this be a metastasis? Or could this be infection? I have seen skull-based osteomyelitis that look really like a tumor or something else. The patient went to the OR and the biopsy shows only inflammation, lymphocytes, and plasma cells everywhere. There are some histiocytes too, and in inflammation, but no neoplasm. The spatial stain shows is positive for IgG4. The patient does not have um, systemic involvement of IgG4-related disease. So this case turned out to be an isolated oropharyngeal and nasopharyngeal IgG4-related disease. Example of the case that is published is a, um, a case that looks like in CA nasopharynx eroding the bone. There's some solid components and restricted diffusion. There are 11 cases reported in English literature. Patients come in with non-specific headache and lower cranial neuropathy. It can mimic nasopharyngeal carcinoma, pituitary macroadenoma, meningioma, neurosarcoidosis, or even lymphoma. There are no calcifications, no flow voids. Erosive changes may occur without sclerosis. In summary, I show you four um, unusual cases. The capnon present with non-specific calcification and ossification within the skull base is slowly growing and does not cause um, symptoms of the compression. I believe this is diagnosis of exclusion because we need to think about tumor first. Besoftang schwannoma is is very very rare. I think the clue is um, a hypo enhancing lesion a well-defined lesion within the base of tongue with very bright on T2 and um, hyper-enhancement on MRI. 
Hemangioblastoma involving the CP angle is very unusual, but it tends to show flow voids within the lesion. Isolated oropharyngeal and esopharyngeal IgG4 related disease can look really like tumor, and we need the tissue biopsy to diagnose it. With that, I would like to thank uh, for your attention. Thank you so much.